All right, check, check. Okay, my mic sounds good. All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. He comes to us from the UK, and he's recently published a book. The beginning of this year, the title of the book is XYZ, The Real Story of How Enigma Was Broken. I've read the book. It's an excellent book, and it provides background into a very important aspect of World War II involving cryptography. And uh, his name may sound familiar. His name is Dermot Turing. Uh, he's a relative of Alan Turing, who I was featured kind of in a, book, a recent movie, The Imitation Game, by uh, starring Benedict Cumberbatch. But Mr. Turing is a prolific author. He has other books. Tied, such titles are The Story of Computing, Prof. Alan Turing Decoded, published 2016. Alan Turing, The Life of a Genius, published 2017. Um, he's also involved in a uh, historical uh, display at the famous Bletchley Park, and that's available to 2028, I believe it's available there. And you can see a lot of the information that he's compiled at his website. It's DermotTuring.com, D-E-R-M-O-T-T-U-R-I-N-G.com. So, uh, Mr. Turing, are you there? I'm here, and thank you very much for that very splendid introduction. Awesome. Great. Well, I'm, I'm delighted that you agreed to the interview. So for people who may not know about your background, can you talk a little bit of anything that I might have missed on the intro and what uh, what led you to write this book? Um, well, yes, yeah, so I'm not a professional historian by background. I'm, I spent my career in the legal profession, but um, the fact of being... Uh, so closely related to Alan Turing has meant that I've always, um, for the whole of my life, really had an interest in the Bletchley Park story and in particular what Alan Turing was doing there. And um, more recently, I guess, to try and find out a bit more about the backstory to the Bletchley Park story. I think people, uh, certainly those who've seen the uh, movie you referred to, The Imitation Game, will know that um, Bletchley Park is very famous for having broken the uh, cipher machine that the Germans thought would, would be unbreakable, the Enigma machine. And Alan Turing's name is very closely associated with that. But I think what's perhaps uh, not quite so well known from that story, and particularly the Hollywood sort of reworking of it is that um, there's there's something sort of quite mysterious about it which is that right up until the middle of july 1939 so that's just fractionally before war broke out in europe and a matter of six weeks before war broke out in europe the british code breakers did not know what the wiring inside the enigma machine was and without that knowledge there was no way they were going to break any single message and certainly no way they were going to invent any um, amazing technological solution to the enigma problem and yet despite that ignorance within a matter of weeks after the outbreak of war the design for Alan Turing's bomb machine, the thing that was going to basically crack the daily problem of how the Enigma machine was set up, that design was already being discussed with the engineers and it was in the hands of the engineers so that they could start working on the prototype before Christmas of 1939. So we've gone from this rather extraordinary state of... of well, Perhaps ignorance is an overstatement, but it's certainly a big gaps in the knowledge. Right through to having designed a war-winning tool, the bomb machine. And how did that manage to happen quite so quickly? That That's a puzzle. And I knew from some of the stuff that I'd read that the Polish code breakers, whoever they were, had had something to do with it. They were part of the answer. But... It was really, really hard to actually find out anything about this. And um, I think it's the late Tony Morrison who said, if you don't, uh, if you can't find a book to read about a subject, then you have to write one. So I guess I found myself in that, that position and, personally. And you had to do a considerable amount of legwork to go and find relatives of uh, many of these Polish, uh, what, what were military officers who really started off the cryptographic research. Can you talk about your inquiries and uh, gathering that information? 
Well, yeah, that that was that, um, you, you describe it as legwork, but actually it's rather fun. Um, and um, I, I was given a great deal of help by the uh, Polish embassy in the UK who keep in close touch with the code breakers and their families. And the reason they do that is because in Poland, the achievement of the Polish code breakers, very poorly understood, very little known about outside Poland. Um, but the, in Poland, it's a really sort of important part of their national heritage. Um, and so they were very, very helpful in putting me in contact with as many of the families as they knew about, which was great. So I got to meet some very interesting people. And here's where it sort of comes alive, really, is that um, one of them in particular has got an amazing collection of um, about 300 photographs taken f during the war years of the Polish code breakers. Um, and they're not sitting at desks with pencils and square paper. These are the code breakers doing stuff in their downtime. And so we've got them, you know, playing ball games, um, curiously playing soccer, wearing um, suits and ties, which I guess is a bit unusual, but <laughs> uh, and um, but also sort of, you know, going on outings and, uh, you know, uh, getting drunk and having parties and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's great. It meant, meant that what, might have been a story about mathematicians and equations actually became a story about people. Yeah, and I mean, I thought that was an interesting aspect of the book, but the the Polish cryptography was very important in the First World War as well. And uh, can you talk a little bit about the people involved in that and how that First World War knowledge went forward towards uh, the beginnings of World War II? Yeah, so, I mean, again forgive what sort of going to sound a bit like a history lesson but um of course poland didn't exist as a country at the outbreak of world war one because it was currently divided between the austrian german and russian empires um but because both russia and austria slash germany had lost the war at different stages um, that meant that there was this opportunity for the Polish state to re-establish itself. And very, very quickly after that, sort of almost immediately after the Polish state was established in November 1918, they had to fight for survival because the Soviet Union decided it wanted to have back the bits of Poland that had been in the Russian Empire. And so this new country had to defend itself. And it very rapidly, and it, and it, it won, um, as we know. But um, part of the reason that it won was that it was able to exploit uh, uh, encrypted Russian uh, radio messages. Um, and that meant that the new head of state, Pilsudski, was very much in the debt to his small team of code breakers in his military intelligence department. And that meant that throughout the interwar period, the code breakers were considered to be more of an elite unit rather than in many countries where military intelligence is kind of, you know, if you're not very good on the battlefield, you get sent off to intelligence because you must be useless. And therefore, that's the only thing they could think of that was left for you to do. Right. Um, and so... Uh, I, I hasten to say that I don't believe that attitude prevails in the 21st century armies, either in the United States or in the United Kingdom. But um, I think it was prevalent 100 years ago. Right. <laughs> um, but that meant that essentially the World War or possibly I should say the immediate post-World War I experience meant that the, Poland really rated its code breakers and actually put them on to... Uh, intelligence challenges right from the get-go and they were they were not only interested in russia but also uh focused towards germany as well many of the early code breakers that you in, in, include whose names was what chieski and palu these guys were all kind of focused on on germany so they were they were aware of the problems of uh, cryptography from that perspective from the polish perspective well, yes. I mean, again, so just looking at Poland's geographical position, it was sort of squeezed between uh, Germany, 
on the west and the Soviet Union on the east. And so it kind of felt to them like they were trapped in a vice. So uh, knowing what the Germans were up to was every bit as important as knowing knowing what the what the Russians were up to. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So recruiting bilingual Polish uh, experts who had grown up in the pre-war years in what was German occupied Polish territory and therefore had these guys had grown up as bilingual German Polish speakers. Um, you know, they were ideally placed to to uh, be recruited by the military intelligence to to um, you know investigate codes and ciphers. Right, and they um uh, they, I think that you wrote in the book that they built the largest radio tower I think in Europe at one <laughs> point, right? To to obtain as much information. But can you talk a little bit about that and how they came yeah, to? Uh... A, that was a very strange. It was a very strange episode because I mean, obviously, monitoring radio traffic is not wholly straightforward, and uh, there's all sorts of atmospheric and electrical questions that can interfere with the signal. And so, clearly, Poland regarded interception as being something that they needed to focus on, and I don't criticize them for that. But what was perhaps completely bizarre was they blew most of their technology budget on this huge radio tower. And that meant that by the time they had actually started making some progress on the Enigma problem, um, there wasn't really anything left in the budget to build the machinery that they needed to uh, uh, help them with with the code breaking. So it was kind of a mixed blessing, that radio tower. <laughs> Gotcha. And can you talk about what Enigma was and why it was uh, such a difficult cryptographical nut to crack? Yeah, I mean, so in World War One, people, the approach that people had to sort of making codes and ciphers was quite simplistic, if you like. You typically have code books where you'd represent a word or a phrase by a four or five digit number or sequence of letters and then you looked it up in a book um, to work out what the what the coded sequence meant and as long as you had the book and the enemy didn't have the book then everything was fine except that the world war one code breakers had managed to uh, rebuild code books without having to capture them and and you just look at the pattern of a sentence that you you can work out you can guess what the next word is going to be from what you've what you've just learned so book book rebuilding was uh, quite well established as a code breakers science by say 1920 but at that stage um engineering genius came in and said well look we've got a better idea if we encipher things by switching one letter for another um that can be done by a machine and what's more it can be done by a machine that changes the cipher every time you type a new letter and the way the way it would change it is by altering the wiring in the machine it's a bit like operating a a, a laptop keyboard if you like where you press an A, but instead of an A coming out on your screen, you'd find a different letter because the wiring has led from A through some complex mechanism that changes it to something else. And they were using a rotor-based device to change the cipher every time you pressed a letter. So every time you press a letter, the rotors move round. That's why you get a different pattern emerging. And so this thing was called the Enigma machine, this thing, this cipher machine. It was... But of course... Oh, sorry. Yeah, you know, well, the real the real challenge is that there's so many different ways that the wiring could be configured in the machine. I mean, it's millions and millions, and uh, if you don't know how that's done, then uh, you're you're not going to be able to break the cipher. That was the that was the security of the machine. And how did they solve that problem? At the beginning? well, there were two there were two problems essentially. The first one was knowing what the wiring is in the machine, and then the second problem is knowing how the machine's set up every day. So just to try and do you a sort of a description of the Enigma machine. It's got, got three coding rotors in it, uh, and they can be put in the machine in any in, in, in whatever order you like. And obviously, if you've got more than three rotors, then there's many more permutations that you can choose from. 
you've got to know which way up the rotors are because they've all got 26 positions one for each letter of the alphabet so you know it could be a b c d whatever that's the uppermost letter so you've got 17,000 odd permutations for which letter is uppermost then there's a thing on the front which is the keyboard which uh, sorry the plug board which um, is another device where you plug in wires to switch one letter for another one uh, and that would introduce I think it's 150 million million different permutations of the ways that, that can be set up so that's that's pretty scary um, and uh, all of this has been changed every day on every network so You've not only got to know what the coding rotors do, what the wiring problem is, that's your hardware problem, but you've also got to know how the machine is set up every day, which is kind of like a software problem. Um, and even if you've stolen an Enigma machine or you've somehow reconstructed it, you've that only helps you with the hardware problem. It doesn't help you with the setup or the software problem. So, so you, you've basically got to tackle both of these things in order to be able to um, read these secret messages. Right. And that's really it. So they're changing it every 24 hours is the setup, right? I think you wrote in the intro to your book, it's 60 yeah. septillion possible combinations. So it's an immense. It's, it's a ridiculously large number. <laughs> that's 24 zeros after once. Yeah. It's something, I mean, I, I can't remember, but there's some, there's some comparative statistic about the number of electrons in the universe or something. I mean, it's something, you know, it's a ridiculously large number. <laughs> Right. So the interesting thing is that the poll, the polls really started their their grind through solving the problem of Enigma very early, much earlier than uh, what would become the French and uh, the English involvement and then the Americans. But uh, can you talk about how they kind of address this problem leading up to 1939? Well, yeah, I think we can look at this again in sort of two parts. The first part is a really great spy story about how some uh, guy working in the German cipher office um, basically had access to the safe and would steal documents out of the safe um, and he'd get paid by French military intelligence to bring them across so the French guy could photograph them and then he put them back in the safe for Monday morning and not thereby not get caught. So there's this whole spy story, which is just, I mean, it's just great. I mean, it's good old fashioned, um, you know, Le Carre style stuff, except that it's real rather than a novel. Right. So that's part one of it. But then the question is, what happened to these documents? Well, the Poles and the French had a sort of liaison arrangement. And so when the Poles got hold of these documents, they put their team of German speaking mathematicians on to uh, trying to figure out what the wiring was in the Enigma machine. And you couldn't figure that out from the documents because the documents were just operating instructions. They weren't technical drawings at all. Um, so what happened was the, there was one particular mathematician, his name was Marian Rievsky, and he figured out that he could turn the, having seen the operating instructions, he could figure out what, that the Enigma hardware problem was a, reducible to a set of permutation equations, which is sort of quite a remarkable piece of thinking to be able to visualize a machine as a set of equations. Um, and so he wrote down these equations and then subject to one thing, he knew that he could actually solve them. He, he'd got, I think, uh, something like six equations and seven unknowns or something. And we all know that you need you, you can't solve that. You need to have one of the unknowns revealed to you. Right. But the one unknown that he thought he could guess at was how the wiring in the Enigma machine was linked up from the uh, keyboard to the place that the electricity enters the three rotors. And he thought, and this is, this is just a brilliant psychological insight by Rievsky, that he thought, well, Germans being methodical, they might have um, uh, used alphabetical order for the connections and um he wasn't wrong because when he tried that and solved his equations with that assumption in his mind it all came out and he was able thereby to reconstruct the wiring in the enigma machines rotors which was i mean 
just as a piece of mathematical analysis, it's sort of mind-blowingly clever. <laughs> and he'd done that. He'd done that by um, probably about Easter time of 1932. Hitler wasn't even in power by that stage. You know, I mean, that's, that's quite, yeah. quite, quite a remarkable achievement. And really, the only the Polish advances were just known to the Polish. It wasn't some, they weren't working together at that or communicating with each other at that point. So. No, I, I, I mean, I think if we, I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all, because if you think about it, most countries are pretty unwilling to share their hard-won um, secret intelligence with anybody else. Um, and in the 1930s, most countries switched sides once or twice. In the 1940s, it happened again. So um, the idea that they were actually going to share this discovery if you like with with uh, uh, their french allies or, or anybody else certainly the british who were nowhere to be seen um you know, that was just inconceivable so uh, i'm not in the least bit surprised they didn't tell anybody but they were quite ha that meant that they were quite happily in a position to create techniques for solving the software problem and then to start reading enigma messages in the mid-1930s so by the mid-1930s they knew exactly what uh, Adolf Hitler and his uh, armed forces were preparing to do. Right. So they were gearing, seeing these movements and the, uh, you know, the Anschluss and all these uh, events uh, probably made them nervous. And I <laughs> yes. that, that uh, led them to reach out. And can you talk about how uh, they they reached out to the French and how this the the, the knowledge of the Enigma got spread around to other countries? Yeah, I mean, I think the Poles were very keen to keep the whole um, success story under wraps uh, for for the reasons I just mentioned. But um, the French and the British sort of, I mean, the French had been very alive to the threat of Nazi Germany for some time. The British sort of woke up to the issue rather late. But um, but by 1938, both the French and the British were uh, effectively stymied by the enigma problem they were clueless about the wiring and um yet yeah, they knew that this was the the way that the germans were going to conceal their secret messages if war broke out so they kind of needed to make some progress on it and it was the french because of their liaison with the poles the french suggested that the three countries should get together and and share know-how on the problem um and i think the the guy in charge of the French effort, um, a chap called Gustave Bertrand, I think that Bertrand must have suspected that the Poles had made more progress than they were letting on. Uh, and the way that he went about setting up the meeting kind of confirmed his suspicions because of the way the Poles reacted to his overture. But the upshot of it was that they started a series of three-party conferences in which began in early 1939. And by the time they got to the second of these conferences, the Poles, you know, they had Hitler, um, you know, just being about as aggressive as it's possible to be on their doorstep. And they all also had this problem that we talked about earlier that they'd blown all their technology budget on this huge um, radio mast um, and they needed to ramp up their uh, engineering capability to solve the enigma in the form that it existed in early 1939 so i think that by that stage they realized that they could probably trade the enigma secret for cooperation both military cooperation with the french and engineering cooperation with the british and so they actually told the brits and the french everything they knew in july 1939 which was the answer to my problem i began with which is how come the brits managed to get from this state of what i call ignorance to building this amazing piece of machinery in such a short time and the answer is because the poles told them everything they wanted to know <laughs> It's right. most extraordinary, extraordinary thing because you really don't expect people to share this, in, share their hard-won secrets. And this, this is how you came up with the title of your book. So the references or the codes, uh, 
for the three parties were X for Paris, Y, London, Z, Warsaw. So you get the X, Y, Z. Yeah, and that was the French. The French who said we're going to use these code letters to um, uh, perhaps uh, keep more secure our communications. I'm not. I'm not convinced that was a particularly uh, um, effective strategy. But okay, it might. Um, it, it it it's kind of it's kind of cool in the code breaking context that they decided to do that. Right. The code. <laughs> then, um, how did how was this? Can you talk about? Uh, Knox and some of these other Brits and how they uh, got advantages and how uh, Turing got involved in the whole Enigma project. Yeah, so the British, I mean, one of the great things about this um, voyage of discovery has been learning about a whole bunch of really quite eccentric folk. But uh, um, so you mentioned Knox. Um Knox was the he was a veteran of the World War One code breaking team that the British had. And by the time of the Spanish Civil War, mid 1930s, he'd been put on to the emerging Enigma problem. And he'd, he'd made some progress. Um, there's more than one version of the Enigma machine and the more simpler versions he was able to uh, find techniques for breaking them, which was a pretty amazing achievement. When he went to go and see this, go to this conference I mentioned, where the Poles actually revealed everything that they knew, because Knox thought he was the world expert on Enigma, he was completely appalled to discover that the Poles knew the answer to every single question. And uh, not only that, but uh, they knew more than he did. Uh, And it was kind of like, you know, having somebody lean over your shoulder and fill in the crossword puzzle for you just when you're about to make your own breakthrough. He was absolutely disgusted by this and threw threw his toys out of the cot and threatened to boycott the meeting. And this was like just at the point where the polls were about to tell even more information. And so he nearly kind of jeopardized the whole info sharing deal which was a disaster but fortunately calmed down by the second day and uh, they got everything they wanted to know so he comes back to the uk and the code breaking uh unit which was then called the government code and cipher school had started hiring some uh professor types from in particular from cambridge but also from oxford um and amongst those professor types was this man called Alan Turing, which was a very unusual kind of a hire for them because he was a mathematician. And the code breakers kind of thought that code breaking was a language, a linguistic problem, and therefore you should be hiring classicists and language professors, not, not really uh, mathematicians. But um, because in the Enigma problem was a mechanical one. They kind of thought that mathematicians might be able to contribute something to it. So they indoctrinated Alan Turing into the uh, Enigma problem quite early in 1939. And so when Knox comes back to the UK, armed with all this knowledge that he's just learned from the polls, he sits down with Alan Turing and they start working on the Enigma problem together in earnest. Um, and so that's really when Alan Turing's involvement with uh, the Enigma starts to take off. And as I mentioned, it's only a matter of, by this stage, it's four, war breaks out only four or five weeks later. So uh, from that point on, they're all transferred physically to Bletchley Park, which is the war station, and uh, they're, they're working on the problem you know, full time from from that point on. And, and uh, Al, Turing was relatively young at the time, twenty seven years old. But his famous paper had been published three years before. It was on computable numbers, right? So he had this foundation of not just math, but also the idea of using mechanical or machines to uh, help in in solving mathematical problems. Can you talk a little? Yeah, bit about and that? I think I think that that all started. Um, uh, you mentioned his paper, but I think. After he'd written that paper, he came and spent two years at Princeton. And um, I think while he was there, he was very 
focused on practical applications of um, you know problem solving through machinery and and so he actually spent some time sneaking off to one of the engineering laboratories at uh, at Princeton and actually trying to make machines to do things i mean he built himself a multiplication machine i don't know how i don't know how it worked but uh, <laughs> um one of the things he did while he was there so he was he was quite he was quite focused on not just the sort of very esoteric equation solving but 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 the mechanical devices for taking the drudgery out of routine mathematical processes right and he wasn't he the one who distilled all kind of machine thinking down to a byte a zero or a one wasn't that kind of his insight or was that is that not correct um i would hesitate to sort of say that that's some sort of somehow his his idea i mean certainly he 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 was quite conscious that um that uh, all mathematical propositions could be uh, represented as a string of ones and zeros. That's the sort of essence of the thing called the Turing machine, which which was in his paper on computable numbers that you mentioned. So yes, I mean that that it's at the heart of that. Whether he's the first to have come up with the idea that um, propositions could be represented in that way, I don't know, but. He certainly realised that binary was a useful um, uh, way of representing both numbers and concepts to um, so that they could be processed in this mechanical way. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he, it would certainly be wrong to say that he invented binary. I mean, that, that, but that wasn't what right. he was well, saying. I, no, <laughs> so, no, I just like to, at the application of binary. But he, um, I mean, when really the invasion of Poland happened, a lot of things changed. And can you talk a little bit about how these crypto, crypto analysts kind of uh, made their way to the West? Yeah, so we've got this bunch of Polish mathematicians who, you know, really the enigma whizzes. Um, when Poland got invaded, um, they very rapidly lost the war with Germany and it didn't help that they were invaded pretty much simultaneously by the Soviet Union as well under the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, so the Polish code breakers, along with chunks of the Polish army, uh, escaped from Poland and reconstituted themselves in France. Um, the code breakers uh, got essentially rescued by Gustave Bertrand, the French guy I was telling you about earlier, um, and uh, joined his French code breaking unit uh, just outside Paris um, as soon as they got to France. And so, what they were able to do is basically continue the code breaking fight against Germany um, by becoming part of the French uh, code breaking team that was still liaising with the British. So, we recreated that sort of XYZ. Um, sorry, X, Y, Z, I'm forgotten I'm talking to an American audience. Um, uh, X, Y, Z triangle was uh, re reconstituted, uh, uh, notwithstanding the defeat of Poland, which was, uh, I mean, again, that was, that was pretty productive. In the early part of 1940, the three teams together were producing uh, intelligence based on the... Uh, Enigma decrypts that they were able to read, uh, um, which should have helped the French uh, in when France got invaded by Germany. There was a there was just a bit of a problem getting the French military to wake up to what they were being told. Yeah, I mean, I think you, there's an interesting part of the book in chapter seven where you talk about how the the Enigma was actually covered up and called Boniface or Boniface or and so even the the high command didn't really or the general staffs of france and britain didn't really warm up to what they were being told yeah well this was the problem that everybody was so hyper secret about the source of uh this special kind of intelligence that they didn't want the knowledge that we could read enemy codes and ciphers to fall into the wrong hands so they 
came up with a cover story that this priceless stuff was being produced by a spy called Boniface, or um, spelt Boniface, but I think they pronounced it Boniface in Britain anyway. Um, but, of course, military men are not stupid, and they realised that, well, anything that's come from a human source is likely to have a degree of unreliability. And some of the stuff that was coming out of Signals Intelligence was so um, un... So so different from what they were themselves expecting that they thought, well, you know, frankly, this spy, he obviously just doesn't know what he's talking about, <laughs> which obviously wasn't true because it was the the spy was the enemy himself. But right. uh, that was, uh, but they didn't know that. So I think yes, you're right. I think they can be forgiven for not reacting uh, quite as well as they should have done. I mean, all that changed after after the. Uh, intelligence departments got uh, understood better how to package their product then uh, they let some of the senior generals in and admirals in on the secret and so it was therefore given a much higher degree of weighting and, and credibility than, than it had had before yeah. and the bertrand you mentioned i think he, you, he wrote or said that he had been feeding sweets to swine so i thought that was interesting and ian fleming kind of pops up at that time but on the subject of secrecy uh, much of this story was kept secret for a variety of reasons. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, the, I mean, clearly it was uh, appropriate to keep a, a keep it secret even after the end of World War Two. Not just that there had been code breaking successes, but most particularly the knowledge about how the allies had gone about breaking codes because that was still of you know particularly as we entered into the cold war phase then that was still very current knowledge and um uh, and of great uh, importance from a sort of national security perspective so i fully understand that if you left Bletchley Park or you left one of the US code breaking agencies you, you know on pain of death you had to keep the secret but it, secrets have this sort of habit of not remaining secrets f forever. And um, I think dribs and drabs of information started coming out in the 1960s and 1970s about the fact that, you know, during World War II, we might actually have been able to break German and Japanese ciphered messages. Uh, and... Eventually, the balloon just burst with the publication of a book by a guy called Frederick Winterbottom in the UK, who had had an association with Bletchley Park, though he was actually an intelligence officer rather than a code breaker. When his book came out, there was a huge sensation that Bletchley Park had broken German codes, and in particular broken the Enigma cipher machine. Um and once that genie was out of the uh, the lamp, then it was kind of impossible to get it back in again. What was really bizarre, though, um, is how the British and American authorities reacted to this. And they were kind of in denial about some of it. And they said, well, OK, now it's known what uh, what happened, then... Um, we can release people from their oath of secrecy, but to the extent that all they do is just say um, that they were at Bletchley Park, um, you know, and they can they can now be proud of their service. But that was kind of a bit weird because there were some people like Gordon Welshman, who was Alan Turing's collaborator on the bomb machine. He was in the US and he wanted to write his memoirs. He was in his mid-70s at the time. Uh, and he wrote his story of his experiences at Bletchley Park. And that included explaining how the Enigma problem had actually been solved. Now, he's doing this in 1983 or 84. Okay. The war's been over for 40 years Nobody's been using an Enigma machine since time immemorial. And yet he is uh, sent 
what feels like a school report by the head of GCHQ saying you ought to know better. And he's had his U.S. security clearance removed. I mean, this is a guy in his 70s. I mean, it's completely bizarre. He's had his security clearance removed for talking about something that has been obsolete for decades. And I find that I still find that sort of very peculiar and um, difficult, difficult to understand. It, but, seems, um... it seems odd. I mean, when they, you wrote in your book, these people had to acknowledge the Official Secrets Act. And I think that that was in perpetuity, right? There's no time yes. limit. No time limit. But, um, uh, you know, the way so the way the Welshman was sort of hounded at the end of his life seems to me to be, uh, I mean, grossly unfair, because this is a guy that ought to have been given a medal for being a national hero. <laughs> so, right. And it seems uh, it seems like the, the untold story of Alan Turing has probably only been publicly recognized for the last two decades, if that. I think that's probably right. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. Um. We are at 40 minutes, uh, Dermot. Do you have anything else you'd like to cover or anything that we missed? I mean, uh, congratulations on the book. It's a spur book. Well, it's kind of, it's kind of, you, kind of you to say that. Um, I, I, I think the one thing I hadn't really quite expected when I embarked upon this uh, mission uh, was to discover that there was this extraordinary sort of Le Carre-esque kind of spy story component to it. And um, um, you know, I'd imagined that writing about code breaking would be sort of quite dry and, um, you know, a bit technical. And and to discover that actually it's about people being robbed at gunpoint on the, on mountain passes in the middle of winter, and and uh, it's about people smuggling documents over borders, wrapping them uh, in greaseproof paper around salamis. Um, you know, I mean that kind of stuff I had never expected to come across in this, and it's great fun. So um, uh, I hope that the story is. is appealing to people who may think that code breaking is something for you know mathematicians and boffins <laughs> great and again your website is dermot turing.com d-e-r-m-o-t-t-u-r-i-n-g.com the title of the book again is xyz the real story of how enigma was broken and it was selected as one of the best books by nature in 2018 so again dermot turing thank you very much well thank you for having me all right have a great day all right, all right. we're good <laughs>